Good afternoon and welcome to uh, our discussion um, about the Black Lives Matter murals. Um, my name is Christy McMillan. As Kristen said, I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by David Feingold and Joseph Pearson. David Feingold is the general manager and CEO of Blue Ridge Public Radio. He grew up in Brooklyn and fell in love with broadcasting at his college's student radio station. He earned an undergraduate degree in psychology at the State University of New York at Binghamton and a graduate degree in mass communications with an emphasis in broadcast and journalism law from Central Missouri State University. He spent the first part of his career in public radio news departments in the Midwest before heading east for a move to television. At CNN, he held several positions, including business news editor, national editor, and London bureau chief. After 10 years in the UK, he returned stateside to join Nebraska's public broadcasting network as the executive in charge of radio and television programming and the regional and national production of news, sports, documentaries, and specials. As he travels around Western North Carolina, he often hears BPR described as a connector of communities and the people that care about them. He and his wife, Ellen, actively participate in many cultural, culinary, and outdoor experiences that are abundant in the Asheville area. Welcome, David. Our other featured guest today is Joseph Pearson. Joseph Anthony Pearson was born in South Mississippi. He attended Jackson State University and graduated with an undergraduate degree in art education in 1969. After a year of teaching in the Mississippi, Mississippi public school system, he left Mississippi for New York City to attend the Art Students League. He was awarded a full scholarship and trained there for five years. He then served in the U.S. Army as an illustrator. After the Army, he came back to Mississippi and began work at Stennis Space Center as an illustrator and retired after 20 years. During his time as an illustrator, he continued to practice and hone his skills as a professional artist. He earned a graduate degree in education from William Carey College in 1994. He has participated in numerous museum shows and competitions. Some of his awards include a UCross Foundation Residency, a Vermont Studio Center Residency, a Louisiana Division of the Arts Artist Entrepreneur Grant, two Pollock Krasner Foundation of New York grants, an Artist Fellowship Inc. of New York grant, and more. His work reflects his fundamental belief that artists are vital members of society and have much to communicate about social justice and human rights. Welcome, Joseph. So today we're going to have a conversation about the murals uh, painted recently um, by Joseph outside of BPR. And in case you didn't get to see them while they were up, this is what they look like. So David, um, please walk us through the timeline of BPR's mural project. Uh, when and why did BPR board up its windows and how did you and your team decide to add a mural to the boards on the station? Thank you, Christy, and, and thanks for the invitation, everybody. Appreciate. I uh, haven't seen, uh, spoken with, to Joseph for a while, and he's somewhere in this mix of videos. So hi, Joseph. Um, appreciate the museum taking this on uh, and having us discuss it, uh, and also for the uh, members of the museum and the station who are with us today. Um, I look back over my calendar to see what the timeline was. Um, if you recall, George Floyd was killed on May 25th. Um, that set off um, protests across the country, including including Asheville. Um, on the on Tuesday, the second of June, so about a week later, I was driving through downtown, and that scene right next to us, as you know, our next door neighbor is the Center for Craft, and they were boarding up their windows, and I was trying to understand why. And then I went through downtown, and I made some calls, and I realized that there had been some um, some vandalism across town, and that any number of storefronts were being um, covered up and artists were already at work on, on murals. So the next day I spoke to uh, our management team and told them about um, my idea that our, um, our boards uh, were a significant canvas that we might make available to, um, to a local artist. And um, my thinking was that while our journalists 
had uh, and continued to be out um, working um, extremely long hours at the confluence of, of three major crises, that this um, had moved, I guess, the, the community, moved the country to another level, and that um, words are what we do, uh, but that at some point, uh, it was time to turn things over to another medium. Uh, in particular, uh, somebody uh, like Joseph. Hi, Joseph, I see you now. I haven't seen you. <laughs> um, and uh, you heard uh, Joseph's background. So um, my first inclination was to uh, say, what, uh, what um, artists in the community would be willing to do this? And I sit on the Arts Council board. Here's where the connection comes with Gail Perry, who is um, Joseph's wife. And um, I had met Joseph um, a couple of times. Um, my first call was to, um, uh, was to Katie Cornell, the executive director of the Arts Council. And I said, I probably can't get Joseph Pearson, but do you have anybody else in mind? <laughs> then here's my idea. But she said, call Joseph. Um, so I did. And we, um, I'm thinking that, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to remember Joseph, you can help me on the timeline. Um, by Thursday, the 4th of June, we had the, the boards primed and we had already ex exchanged ideas. And by Friday, Friday the 5th, late in the day, you started sketching and working. Uh, only later did I realize, having seen some photographs, that Gail actually helped you as well. I think that was Saturday after I had gone. And I believe you worked through the weekend and finished up on Monday. So that was the timeline. We, we, Public radio is about um, providing a platform for expression. It's, we are our own medium, but here we had an opportunity to use another medium that we um, don't often have with um, somebody uh, of Joseph's renown and the ability to document um, a moment in the community. And this was a moment in the community um, that's profound, that's still with us. And I think uh, Joseph's art reflected that. And so that's how the project got going. Thanks, David. Um, Joseph, I'm having a hard time unmuting you. Are you able to hit the unmute? Perfect. Okay, great. How's that? Yeah. Yes. We just unmuted him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I'm We're having boy. some technical difficulties this morning. Um, so, Joseph, uh, talk to us a little bit about your planning process for the, uh, the BPR mural. Um, how closely did you work with David and the BPR staff um, on the imagery and getting everything together? Mm -hmm. I think I got the call on Tuesday, what would that be, the 4th, <clears throat> and my wife, Gail, said, you got to do this. I said, well, wait a minute. I have to see the space. I need to get an idea of what they're thinking about before I commit to anything. So I thought about it. I think I called or text David and got an idea of what BPR was thinking about. Then I had to come see the space. David sent me images of the space. I went and you know, look and measure the space because seeing the space helps me when I'm thinking about an idea, how to fit that idea into the particular space. You know, I could come up with an idea and it may have be completely off in terms of working in that particular space. So I got back to David, I think Wednesday, say, yes, I would do this. And David said, well, we'd like to have it done by this weekend. I, I said, something that I can't repeat here, but I'll, I'll get back to you. So Wednesday, I said, I'll do it. Thursday, the wall was prime. Friday, about two o'clock, I started painting. I worked Saturday and worked Sunday to get it done. Our, as we went back and forth in terms of ideas, I was initially thinking that where I have the protesters on the larger wall, that I would include Mr. Floyd over there and have the police kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck in the panel where Mr. Floyd is now. And as you know, Dave and his staff and we talked about it, we realized that we don't want to perpetuate this negative imagery. Mm -hmm. You want folks to see and remember the man from a position point of dignity. So we left that out and I moved Mr. Floyd to where he is now. And by doing so, it gave him a more 
prominent spotlight. He's there by himself. And I wrote his name, Mr. Floyd, above the image so that when folks read this, they are addressing him from a position of respect. Not George Floyd, not George, Mr. Floyd, because right. we're emphasizing his humanity. With the protesters, the larger panel, we, um, we wanted to echo what BPR is about. The voice of the people, in, in essence, and David can correct me on this if I'm wrong, of course. The voice of the people. We have people expressing their concerns over the situation in their, their signage. We wanted to echo that. And we also wanted to say that this is happening in Asheville, that Asheville is taking part of this worldwide movement. And a major landmark downtown, of course, is the courthouse. Everybody would recognize that. So we put the courthouse in the background to say that this is Asheville. And the kneeling figure, we chose him because the kneeling suggests peacefulness. This was a peaceful protest. How threatening can you be if you're kneeling? And my wife had the idea of using a, a few lines from a speech that the late Reverend Dr. King made that we thought was very important to this. He says, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. In one of the, some of the verbiage on one of the signage, someone said, silence is violence. And when we look back at the death of this man, there was two or what, three policemen standing there. Did nothing, said nothing, said nothing. Their silence, to me, suggested complicity. That was the basic thinking behind the whole process. And can you talk a little bit more about this panel here, the main uh, photograph with the image? I, I know that you said that you were looking for an image of dignity, um, and I think that we've all um, heard a lot about uh, Mr. Floyd, um, you know, uh, in the news from his hometown, um, learning more about him. How did you choose this particular image? When I started gathering source material, <clears throat> I looked for images of him, and the one, this one struck me most because I liked that he was wearing a what, sports jacket because we're talking about dignity. And we wanted to present him from that point of view and have him wear a sports jacket suggested that, in addition to that, the color of the jacket, a little purplishness in that blue, suggests royalty, not royalty in, from a political sense, but royalty in terms of our common humanity. And the yellow, the symbolic color of yellow is spirituality, or spirituality, the yellow is the symbolic color for that. I wanted to echo that in the background. Plus, yellow and purple are complements, so the whole thing tied together. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really striking image. Um, so we had looked, I think, at, at most of the panels, and I'm seeing here, um, this is something that you provided me with, David. It's the breakdown of sort of how many pieces of, of wood there are, and we'll come back to that um, in a little bit um, when we talk about sort of the long-term uh, housing of this particular mural, because it, it certainly is, is going to have a life uh, after. So, um, Joseph, if you could talk a little bit about um, what materials did you use for the BPR mural project and how did you select them? Did you select them for durability or did you select them for quickness? Um, I know that you had a very tight um, turnaround uh, for the time in which, uh, you know, you were putting together the project. So how did you select the materials and about how long did it take um, for everything to come together? I love this image. Fortunately, <clears throat> from a mural project I had done further down the street, Biltmore and Ego, the Hope Springs Eternal mural, I had several gallons of that paint left over. The paint is by a company named Nova, 
it is some of the best quality acrylic artists acrylic paint out there and having that paint left over i use some of that for its quality and durability and once david and i talked and i had a better idea of where we were going with it it was just a matter of gathering source material as reference and of course uh, art like jazz sometimes you have to improvise and improvise so in some cases as i'm painting i painted over stuff as it as i saw it didn't relate to something i put down previously and worked in other ideas to make the image say what we wanted it to say right so speaking of which uh david if if we go back to um the image <clears throat> excuse me of how uh joseph um constructed let me pull that back up onto the screen um they're all here very carefully numbered um and outlined where they go so what are the what are the long what's the long-term plan for the bpr mural because i know that you've since uh removed it from uh yes. the windows well, well, as you can see, it, you know, we are at Broadway, uh, 73 Broadway, next to the Center for Craft. And our main entrance is where you see Mr. Floyd, uh, his portrait, uh, and the kneeling figure across two doors. The longer part of that uh, with the protesters, um, some of our back offices, actually, um, our uh, technology guys are there. One of them, uh, Duncan Fowler, um, came down when we had the um, panels removed and supervised their careful removal and storage in uh, secure storage that we own uh, and uh, made sure that we mapped out the, uh, the, uh, the exact location of where these um, pieces would go so that ultimately, you know, we're, we are listening, we're um, hoping uh, to uh, find out some opportunities for the, for the mural and working with Joseph to um, find uh, places that it can be exhibited uh, for all the community to see and for uh, a long time to come. And so that's, I understand there are discussions in the community. Um, we're, we're waiting to find out what those opportunities will be, but we thought we would uh, protect uh, this great work uh, in the meantime and, and make sure that uh, we know how to reassemble it when the time uh, comes. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Joseph, as a working artist, um, murals and public art projects have long been a part of your practice. Uh, how is the BPR mural similar to or different from other murals that you've worked on in the past? Fortunately, I, know, I, think, I think all the murals that I've done have had at its core the essence of what my work is about, which is addressing social political concern, concerns as I see and perceive them. And considering what this mural is about, it just ties into that, that whole body of work. This is a social political issue. And this mural just allowed me to lend my voice to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, when you were uh, putting together your imagery, thinking about what you wanted to paint, um, were there any other murals around the Asheville area painted around the same time that you found inspiring? Unfortunately, I did not have time to visit or see much of what other artists were doing <clears throat> at the time. You know, as I'm driving to and forth from the mural site, I saw work that other artists was doing. But some of the art that had already been done here in the area, I was inspired by, there's a, a mural company called Brush Can, you might have heard of it. Jeremy and Scott are the artists behind those, those murals. They have a lot of beautiful work that, there's a, uh, what's the sports store up on Munford, the fishing scene? Yeah. Well, if you haven't seen it, when you go up that way, you will see it now because I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just love their, their technical knowledge and being able to work that well on large scale like this is just fascinating. So they are constantly 
inspiring to me. They also did a mural up the street from where we live, just across from Taco Billy's, mm -hmm. with an old, uh, I think, garage. And I had opportunity to watch them do some of that work. And I was inspired by that as well. And of course, there are a lot of old school muralists that I'm inspired by, especially those of your WPA. Yes. For absolutely. you young folks, works project <laughs> administration. Yeah. So I know uh, from having worked with you in the past, being very familiar with your work, that um, social justice issues, violence against black men, and images that challenge stereotypes about African Americans are often themes that appear in your work. Um, where does the BPR mural fit in? And I have uh, some different uh, works of yours, if, if you'd like for me to pull them up and, and we can walk through those at any time, you just let me know. Okay. Because, again, <clears throat> it is addressing the essence of, not all of my work, but basically a social political issue. And this has been something I have been doing and involved with for more than 40 plus years. And it ties in because of that very fact, plus murals being public art. I see it as speaking and in my voice to the voice of the people, especially as you read some of the signage, what folks are saying. They are addressing some of the social ills of society and in that and giving visual representation to that, it ties into my overall body and work relative to social political issues. Mm -hmm. So should we look at some of your um, paintings? I'm gonna pull sure. those up now. It'll make more sense than what I'm yeah. talking about. Okay, so I've got the first one on the screen, screen here, Miscarriage of Justice from 2008. Um, tell us a little bit about this one, Joseph. I went back and did some research. I was trying to remember what was going on during that time who had been killed since 1999, many. But for some reason, I was just struck with the idea that I needed to do something, you know, about this at that particular time. And I call this miscarriage of justice because as you look at all the murders of unarmed black folks, and all the folks who committed those crimes walking away, I see that as a miscarriage of justice. And I, I designed this to speak to that visually in this way. Lady Justice in the background with suggestions of the red, white, and blue flag, America. I distorted her deliberately to say that justice for people of color in America is distorted. And yeah. she's also blindfolded. You say justice is blind. Justice is not colorblind. It's misguided towards some of us. And this piece is intended to speak to that. Of course, uh, we'll be going to the polls in November. Um, this is a very striking image, the right to vote. Tell us a little bit about this one. I took this image from a photo reference I found. It goes back, to, I think, to the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And considering the 2016 election and considering some of the talk around, you know, gerrymandering, I thought this issue is, this, this particular image is as relevant today as it was back then in terms of efforts to hinder our right to vote. Yeah, we have um, the original photograph by Bruce Davidson in our collection and um, it'll be on view when we reopen. Mm -hmm. 
This is one of my favorites. I know some of uh, the folks uh, that are logged in today have seen this and talked about this uh, particular painting with you and me um, a couple of years ago. Um, Lady Justice was uh, in the Miscarriage of Justice painting at the beginning uh, and appears in a very different way in this painting. Um, can you walk us through this one? Yes. At the time that I was doing this, I was hearing and reading a lot about the wage disparities <clears throat> between men and women for comfortable work. And I read that women on average earn about 20% less than do men for similar or same work. Black women is even less than that. So I thought I, I needed an image that incorporated racial, gender, and economic bias all in one. And I have, again, a distorted area of the flag because we're talking about America. And things are different in other countries and similar, but we're talking about America. And in this image, I had this model. Young lady's name is Christina. I made a cross. The cross represents persecution because injustice is a form of persecution. And I have her partially nude like this to suggest humiliation. It's one thing if I say publicly, walk down the street and, it, and decide to take my clothes off. That's one thing, I'm volunteering to do that. But when if I walk down the street and somebody rip my clothes off, that's embarrassing. That's humiliating. So this bias, this injustice is humiliating. So this partial nudity is intended to suggest that it's also a form of crucifixion, hence the cross, the suffering. And in her right hand is a dollar bill with 20% of it missing, representing that wage disparity. In her left hand is a hammer representing labor. And also in the back, you have two dimes representing again, that 20%. Yeah. This is scales of unequal justice, economic, racial, and gender bias in America. I have always absolutely loved this painting. It is so strong and so um, powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, American Enigma from 2015. I, I read something so many years ago. Uh, the question was asked, what to do, one, what to do with the Negro, we were Negroes then, and how to educate Black men, Black boys. And for me, the answer was simple. You educate us the way you educate anybody else. And the issue, the question that it raised is that we are puzzling to certain elements of society. What to do with us? How to treat them? How do we, how do we relate to them? The answer again is simple, with human dignity. So I decided to take this piece. I met this young man at the uh, gym there in uh, New Orleans. We were living there. And I used him as a model for this because I wanted a young black male, and I deliberately, again, we're talking about America, hence the red, white, and blue, and the stripes of the flag in the background. And I deliberately took pieces out of it to create a puzzle effect, because we not know what to do with us represents, presents us as an enigma, a mystery. Yeah, people have commented on the uh, puzzle with missing pieces. Exactly. Yeah. So this piece is intended to speak to that. Just a couple more images. This one's amazing. Again, your scales and your flag are appealing in the plea. Mm-hmm. You got the scales of justice. And again, the distorted version of the American flag suggesting that justice for 
some of us in America is distorted. And as is taking place now, we are pleading for justice, for fair treatment under the law. This piece is designed to speak to that. Um, Emmett Till, Portrait of Innocence, Images of Hate, uh, another pastiche of images um, like your right to vote, mm -hmm. but with some re recognizable folks on this one. Mm -hmm. This taking of lives of, well, in this case, innocence, young black men, and there's a long history of it. But I wanted to make kind of a, not a comparison, but tie the two of these, these young men together. And I wanted to speak to the horrors of the indignities that these young men and we suffer over, over something that should not cause the taking of someone's life. Emmett Till accused of whistling at a white woman. Cost him his life. This young man, supposedly in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, even though he was going home in that neighborhood. Over what? It says that, well, we are saying today Black Lives Matter. These incidents suggest that for some folks, it does not matter. And these images intended to just kind of bring home the fact, bring home the point that we need to emphasize and re-emphasize that yes, our lives do matter. And I think the stronger we put these images out there, hopefully, the stronger the impact it will have. This is your most recent work. I believe you completed it just a couple of weeks ago um, and has a lot of um, just absolutely fresh, raw imagery. If you could talk a little bit about this um, self-portrait from 2020. Yes, I'm thinking, and I started out again, using Mr. Floyd, but then I realized, well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't have to use somebody else. I use myself, because I could just easily be Mr. Floyd. So I did a self-portrait and wearing my mask, and I decided to make the mask towards the American flag. And in that American flag, I have torn it to suggest Justice for people of color in America is ragged. And I have Lady Justice hanging by a thread off of this American flag, suggesting that justice for some of us is fragile in America. And I took some of the signage from uh, some of the protesters that I've seen speak out. Black Lives Matter. Silence is violence, because I wanted to, again, not only echo the voices of the people, but add my voice to the people's voice. Thank you. Uh, speaking of which, um, it was announced last week that you have been selected as one of the three um, lead artists on Asheville's own Black Lives Matter street mural. Congratulations. Um, please tell us a little bit more about the project and what your involvement will look like. We are in the process of working out our design and tying those designs together, I meaning among the three of us. We will have working with us <clears throat> uh, support artists, artists to what will help us get this done. I understand there's a short time frame as to whenever that is decided, you know, to get it done. But it, right now, we're just working out the ideas. Okay. <laughs> 
And um, I've got some screen, screenshots here from the Asheville Area Arts Council um, who are uh, working with Shanika Smith, um, Councilwoman, on um, putting this project together. And this is a, sort of a mock-up rendering of what it will look like uh, wrapping uh, the street of uh, Pack Square, both South and North Pack Square. So congratulations uh, again, Joseph, uh, one of the three lead artists with Jenny Pickens and Marie Cochran. Thank you. Um, and if anyone would like more information about that project or to help support it, uh, I've put the website here, ashevillearts.com slash BLM. Uh, Joseph, where can folks see examples of your work locally? I know that you've been involved in several public art projects in addition to um, the BPR mural, um, such as it also, uh, such as at uh, Eagle and Market, no, sorry, it's at Eagle and Biltmore Avenue, um, mm -hmm. as well as a project at All Souls, Benet on Eagle, um, and of course your studio at Pink Dog. So if folks want to see more works by Joseph Pearson, where do they go? They could go to josephart.net. They could go, you may be able to go inside, but you can certainly, excuse me, see through the window the Benet on Eagle Street mural. And if you're able to go inside, you'll also see four charcoal portraits of some of the people who had businesses in that area at the time. And the mural was designed to reflect what that area, the block, which was the black business district of Asheville at one time, what it looked like in 1960 something prior to justification. The mural at the corner of Ego and Biltmore, Hope Springs Eternal, uh, I did the, this was a collaboration of about, I think, five of us. And my part was to paint the mural in the background. It's a nine feet, seven inch by 32 inch mural. is is an abstracted map of what the block looked like, you know, back in the day. The mural at All Souls Cathedral, Biltmore Village, speaks to uh, the ocean, but that area, some of what the history of that area, which was formerly uh, a black community before the, Van the Vanderbilts bought them out and moved them to an area now called New Shiloh. And it also speaks to some of the programs of the All Souls Cathedral. You know, they have an outstanding choir, they have a little, uh, community basketball court, and they're also involved with certain community food services, you know, and other uh, elements of their programs. The, what is large enough to be a mural is four feet by 40 inches piece for the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina also speaks to the, the new Shiloh community. It addresses some of that history. It highlights five major landmarks of that area. The, Crump uh, Complex, the Rock Hill Missionary Baptist Church, their community garden, uh, AME Zion, and I think Mission, is, I think is the, no, Brooklyn Church, which is the oldest church in that area. So these have kept me busy for the past eight months, almost a year. Just eight months, you've accomplished all that. <laughs> you're, you're so busy. You're so busy, Joseph. And uh, we did mention that you do keep a studio at Pink Dog Creative. I've put the um, address here, 342 Depot Street. You're in Studio 130. Um, are you keeping open studio hours these days? Or if people want to come by, do they make an appointment with you? But presently, I am not keeping open studio. I mean, they're working, but I'm not set up to open to the public just yet. Okay. We'll keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a couple last questions for both David and Joseph before we open it up to questions that have come in through the chat box. And please, if you do have questions that you'd like to pose uh, to David or to Joseph, please go ahead and add them in the chat at any time. And we will, um, get to them here in a, just a few minutes. Um, so my, my question is uh, to both of you and, and feel free to, to, you know, whoever wants to go first, 
does the current moment, which, you know, is, is rife with uh, unrest and a, a lot of sort of uh, taking to task and really reevaluating who we are uh, as Americans, does this current moment give you hope for the future? Just if you want to start, I'll let you lead the way. <laughs> well, it does, but I take that hope with a grain of salt. I say that because we've kind of been here before with protests and a lot of rhetoric. So, but because of the magnitude of the movement and because there are so many diverse ethnicities and backgrounds involved in it, I am hopeful that some positive change will come out of it. But again, I take that with a grain of salt. What about you, David? Um, you know, first of all, I think uh, it's important. I think we have uh, those of us who are practitioners of journalism that this is a different time. This is a pivotal, a pivotal moment in the uh, nation and in our community in general. Um, and there is a reckoning. Uh, there's an opportunity to really experience reckoning with systemic racism. But personally, the filter that I have to look through is a lot of the experience I had as a as a journalist, and um, um, you, you see the good and you see the, the horrible in terms of the kind of work that I did previously. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful in general. Um, I'd like to be hopeful for the sake of the community and for the sake of my, uh, my children. But um, uh, I think that this is an opportunity that um, will have to um, be enlarged uh, and, and reported on and documented, which is what our role is and the role of the mur a muralist like Joseph. And so the, the partnership at least gives me some hope that we've found ways to um, use our own media uh, to explain things and to uh, reflect the community. Thank you. I think that that's a perfect sub segue to my next question. Um, you, you chose very specifically to not just have plain boards. You had um, a beautiful mural painted by Joseph um, in front of BPR. Um, so I, I think that you do believe that art can be a tool for social justice and change. What did you hope to achieve by, by um, having the mural outside of BPR? Uh, I'm not sure that it was um, advocating for um, f for social change exactly in the way you put it. Um, our approach is to give voice in many cases where the opportunity is not there, and also to go beyond um, our journalism. And if you listen to public radio, you will hear the work of artists who are musicians and 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 in other areas of creative expression. So uh, for, for, for the good of, 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 uh, of the moment and for the opportunity for those people to um, make important decisions in their lives and on behalf of the country, we wanna get the, amount, the, the kind of expression that Joseph's mural represents, the kind of expression that other artists um, are able to articulate um, through, um, art that is both political uh, and, uh, and documents. Uh, in general, that's what we were trying to do and, uh, and, and, and start a conversation and hope to continue a conversation. That's our goal. Um, be part of that part of the process, not the end, not the end of the process. Thanks, David. So same question, question to you, Joseph. How can art be a tool for social justice? You've really um, invested a lot of your time and energy as a, as a career-long artist um, in social justice through art. So why do, you, why do you invest it? Why do you believe that art can make a difference? We live and have lived for some time in an area of 30-second sound bites. We have how many times do you watch the news and you see breaking news and then something else dramatic happens and it's breaking news. It's one major issue after another, but we move on to one from the other without really taking time to explore and look and learn from whatever it is we're being exposed to. Art, on the other hand, freeze frames. Not only does it freeze frame certain 
issues and points of view, but it also offers a different perspective from artist's perspective on whatever is going on. And because it is a visual, well, or book or poetry, but as a painter, because it is visual, it forces folks, hopefully, to stop and spend enough time in front of the work to really think about whatever it is that the artist is saying. And with my work in particular, it's always been about communication. You know, since I'm four years old, it's always been about communication. I want folks, I, it doesn't matter if folks agree with me, but I do want to provoke a response from people whether it be intellectual or emotional, whether they are pleased with the work or not, it doesn't matter. But I want to, I want to get a spark out of folks. I want to know that they are engaged in the work, that they are thinking about the work, that they are paying attention, trying to figure out what's going on in the work. And the hope is, depending on what they take away from it, to act on that, to take it back into their communities, back into their families. And in that way, art can affect change. Yeah, I think that that's exactly what um, we try to do here at the museum as well. And I see that, you know, we're on the same page that um, it's not necessarily just sort of art for art's sake, but it's art to be used as a conversation and a springboard to work through issues. And sometimes mm -hmm. art can, can be, um, you know something that people can look at and talk at and talk through together um and and can be um uh less confrontational um for some people to to sort of talk through um big issues through the through the lens of talking about art absolutely yeah so Kristen, I know you've been keeping track of questions in the chat box um I'd like to thank joseph and david for for um for their conversation today and would love to open it up to questions that have come in through the hour. Yes, thank you both. It's been wonderful and we have had quite a few questions come in so I will do my best to get through all of them keeping uh, the time in mind. So the first question is from Judy Upjohn and this can be for either of you and Christy you may also be able to weigh in. Um, she was asking, did other businesses intentionally board up their storefronts to invite paintings? What, what was the question? So she wanted to know if other businesses around Asheville intentionally boarded up their windows to invite paintings or murals similar to yours. Well, I, I can't say because I haven't uh, talked to any other artists who who did them, you know, uh, when I did pass an artist who were working, of course, they were busily engaged in the work. And I know what that means, especially on the short time frames. So I didn't take time to, you know, question them. So I, I can't say. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure um, either. Uh, the reason we boarded it up was to uh, protect uh, our staff who works inside and uh, uh, out of an abundance of caution as well as the facility. And uh, after um, doing that, uh, it, it presented itself as a mural. I'm not sure how um, other organizations made the decision. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question is from Steve Wilcox for Joseph. He's asking if you executed the mural alone or if you worked with assistance. This particular mural? Yes. This was 99.9 tenths percent by myself. My wife came along and, you know, added, uh, added her efforts for about an hour or so, I think, Sunday, because, you know, we were trying to wrap it up. And, you know, I needed a little help to go ahead on it and do that. But it was done largely by myself. And, and most of the projects I've done have been by myself. I, I can work in collaboration with other artists, but, and it's quicker, of course, but when I'm working alone, I know where I'm going with it. I don't have to have every detail worked out in the process. If you like jazz, I can kind of improvise and change as I go along as I feel a need to. But if I'm working with somebody else and they have a particular assignment in that work, 
then it could get to be complicated. I remember you telling me when we were talking about the planning process, Joseph, that um, with due to the quick turnaround of this particular mural that um, you had very few preliminary sketches that you did your preliminary sketching directly onto the boards. Mm -hmm. I did, I think, one or two quick sketches that initially, as I said before, included the, the policeman and I, and I showed that to Dave and that's when we decided, no, 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 we, we don't want to do that. We don't want to add to that negative image. So when I took that out and replaced Mr. Floyd, that was the extent of the preliminary sketching, except directly onto the to the boards. Great. Um, and Christy, we have someone actually asking if you wouldn't mind pulling up a picture of the mural again, just as we discuss it. Sure. Let me find um, it. Just a sec. No problem. And so, Joseph, along those same lines, William Gay wanted to know about how long it took you to actually design and create the mural. Friday, I think I spent two hours. Saturday was three. I think Sunday was two. And with the mixing of the paint at the studio and other prep time, I would say about 10, 12 hours. Yeah. Pretty quick turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I've learned simplicity. And sometimes in my work, I tend to go overboard. I will overcomplicate before I come back to that middle ground of simplicity. There's power in simplicity. I agree. Um, well, we have Mary Alm who's asking if you could tell us uh, um, if there's any significance to the empty space you left around the peace sign on the mural. <laughs> or oh, perhaps that's Trace. just also simplest simplicity. <laughs> yeah, you, you want trade secrets now. Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 well, one, we were running, we were pressed for time. Plus, <laughs> Uh, it was getting to be a little uh, disconcerting, you know, the ladder, you know, with people on the street like that. And rather than try to, you know, paint, because I was going to just paint a background in that area to start with, we thought about putting uh, reflections of, you know, the mountain ranges behind us. But then I decided, again, one, I'm complicating a little bit. And secondly, even though it would have spoken to the Asheville area, it didn't lend much in terms of the overall message that we were trying to get across. So I just put that ochre background in the background and painted the peace sign on top of that and painted that peace sign in red because red has the power of drawing attention. Great. Um, and we have from Laurel Kutsenko. Uh, she wants to know if you paint and then title your work or if you have a title in mind and then paint it. Titling is, is, is a challenge sometimes. Sometimes I, I, I don't know what to title it. I just do the work and then see what is suggested. And sometimes I have a particular title in mind as an impetus for starting the ideas in, in my head. If I'm thinking in a, from a certain point, say like uh, well, social justice, and the more I think about that, then the more images form that leads me to do work relative to that particular title. But for the most part, I don't have a title, I just have an idea. And once the idea is worked out, then I try to figure out what to call it. <laughs> just to give folks a sense of direction or a stepping off point in terms of what I was thinking. And we have a question from Michelle Dorf about um, the Black Lives Matter mural that the city is having to do outside the museum actually, right in Pack Square. Um, and she wants to know if uh, 
how the mural will be protected. And perhaps that's something you're still thinking about. That I can't answer to. I think the director of the Arts Council and the city are talking about that. Perfect. Well, we also have some questions about some of your other works that you've done. Christy, if you wouldn't mind pulling up Miscarriage of Justice. Um, Michelle also wanted to know if there was any significance to the red ball in the image. The red ball. Oh, this is what, 2008? Yes. At the time that I was that, that little red ball represents a balloon. And at the time that I was doing that, we had had, we, my wife and I, a major health issue. And because I believe in a higher power, I wanted to use some image in the work that reflected my gratitude and my sense of hope. And I used a balloon because a balloon floats. You turn it, it floats. Hope lifts us up. And the balloon represented a lifting of that hope. And that hope is what got us through that, uh, that crisis in our lives at the time. And after using that symbol, a few times I came to the conclusion that one is beginning to become contrived. So I stopped using it and I decided too that I really don't need to include elements like that in the work to express my, my faith and my belief. Because I read something, I think it was uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer, uh, art historian, wrote a book called uh, Art in the Bible. And what I learned from that is we don't have to have, I don't have to have external symbols to speak to my faith, just the exercising of my, of our in particular skills and gifts in and of themselves is an exercise of that faith. So I, that's what the balloon was about. That's beautiful. Um, we have one more question um, about this painting from Karen Milnes, and she wants to know about the shadow on the left. <laughs> that was me taking a picture of this young man standing next to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided to leave it in because I thought it was, one, it was an interesting compositional element, and secondly, because it just raised that question. It makes folks curious. What is this about? Why is that there? What do you mean? Who is it? It draws folks Absolutely. into the work. Calls, <laughs> folks to calls for the calls. Absolutely. Well, it's about 1.30, so I think that's all the time we have for today for questions. So thank you again, Joseph and David, for being here, for your thoughtful thank responses you. to the questions. Um, and thank you, Christy, for moderating today's program. Um, I think we're all hoping uh, to see some positive change in our country. Um, and so I also want to thank our museum members and BPR's members for joining us today. I know you're all eager to get back to the museum and we look forward to welcoming you back um, as soon as we can open and it's safe to do so. In the meantime, we do hope you will continue engaging with us virtually through our member, uh, our museum from home page on the website. And as a reminder, I will send out an evaluation in a little bit to collect your feedback for today's program. And I hope to see many of you again for the next program. Um, so stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of your day.